Hello ladies and gentlemen and welcome to The Right Opinion, the home of a twat with too much free time and many of you are likely well acquainted with my established status as a gamer. In fact, probably one of the best gamers there is out there. Truth is, I only don't compete in tournaments because I'd really hate to put any of these so-called competitive players out of a job, especially when I am so blessed to have alternative sources of entertainment. Yes, my field of interest isn't merely restricted to one meadow. You see, like most people, I love a good mystery. And today we have nothing less than one of the online world's strangest happenings. One that has baffled observers, and even after its resolution, left far more questions than answers. Nonetheless, whereas most of our topics are embroilments on our resident platform, we have to turn our attention to our YouTube's contemporaries, and dare I say it, competitors for today's situation, Twitch. Twitch, like YouTube, is a video sharing platform where one can tune into their favorite creators and view various genres of content. However, unlike YouTube, Twitch's format prioritizes live streams, which often provides more direct interaction between a creator, the content, and their audience. It's fair to say that YouTube also offers this feature, and most people have taken advantage of it at some point. However, as YouTube isn't thought to provide the same attention to it that Twitch does, most tend to opt the latter when it comes to streaming. With that said, Twitch isn't without its issues either, many of which have been on display in the last few years, particularly their policy which has often led to accusations of hypocrisy and double standards. Milo. Now with these large platforms, some sort of double standard is inevitable, particularly given the special treatment that larger creators have been known to afford. With that said, Twitch's attempts to find any consistency have often led to criticisms of the opposite, and their nature to double down hasn't helped that. I'm not going to detail each individual example because we'd be here all year, and that's a bit longer than I want to make my video. But their lack of transparency on the matter has left some streamers believing they've been indefinitely banned for the most milk toast of faux pas. And in the live stream business, where there are no editing tools between the video and the viewer, that can be risky business. On the other hand, though, there are platform darlings who have been welcomed back despite multiple breaches of their supposed all-encompassing creator guidelines. For many, there's unfairness, and then there's Twitch. There are a fair few theories about why Twitch is so wildly inconsistent, but I think the most deeply rooted one is that simply put, they're a business. They need to hold on to the main sources of that business, especially when there are alternative platforms offering the same service. If they went and banned their biggest names, even if it was for good reason, those names may just migrate to a competitor who will tolerate their antics, taking all their audience and income with them. Even if it leads to greater moral inconsistency, their current practice keeps their platform afloat, which is probably their prime concern. However, at the core of this pretty logically sound explanation, there is one rather significant exception to that rule. So I think it's high time to introduce our title character. Fucking level three. Fucking out of everything, he had a level three! Everything! This guy had a level three! He can't even open a fucking bag! Huh? Doesn't even know how to open a bag! Doesn't know how to loot! Doesn't know how to do nothing! Look at him! See, look at him! Look at him! Running down the middle of the goddamn fucking street! This is Dr. Disrespect. He's a streamer with a pretty significant recurrent following. He's mostly known for playing shooters, although he's not too fussy and will play whatever takes his fancy, really. In a way, he doesn't need to specialize because over the years, his success hasn't necessarily been attributed to his in-game performance. Not that it is lacking. More so, though, his on-screen persona, with a defined brand and attire to match. He's always been a bit of a gamer, though, even claiming to have won blockbuster video game tournaments in 93 and 94 back in the day. I'm sitting there at the Blockbuster World Champions Championships <laughs> at Marine World in Vallejo, California. 200 tube TVs lined up right on all these tables, right? Maybe a couple hundred people, maybe just kind of walking around the area, not sure what's going on. But it was probably the first LAN um, event slash tournament in the history of video games. I was there and I won. However, gaming hasn't been his only interest. In 2005, he graduated Cal Poly with a degree in business and marketing management with a stint in the college basketball team. In the years following, he dabbled in gaming but began working behind the scenes at video game company Sledgehammer and a live streaming website known as Justin.tv, which had a pretty thriving gaming section at that time. However, in 2011, Justin TV decided to separate this section to a humble spin-off site known as Twitch. And well, the rest was history there. With experience in community management, gaming, and business with some of the most media-relevant companies, the doctor decided to chance his arm on the other side of the stage curtains, to pretty resounding results. So the winner is... <laughs> Dr. Disrespect! One thing when I started my channel, 
I had no idea what I was getting into. It was just having a good time. Let's just do our thing. But a year and a half later, I realized a lot of things. Uh, I realized that I've, I've provided an outlet for a lot of people that are dealing with a lot of hardships. And it makes me proud. In the years coming up to 2020, our trash talking Twitch amassed a multi-million following, won numerous awards, acquired a variety of mainstream sponsorships and endorsements, and instituted himself as a force to be reckoned with. However, he was not entirely unproblematic in his time. Dr. Disrespect was known for having a somewhat abrasive and even divisive persona. And in a way, that makes sense. It's part of the appeal. Javi did occasionally straggle the line between abrasiveness and offensiveness, his outspoken nature often clashing with those who disagreed with him or held disdain for his comments. In 2019, he was suspended from Twitch for two weeks after he filmed inside a public restroom at the annual E3 convention, violating Twitch's own guidelines and California state law. In that case, following the restoration of his channel, some perceived Doc as part of the Twitch cabal that could never face real repercussions for their mishaps. As a creator with millions of followers and a cemented history at the company he represented, he was obviously going to possess some power in his channel status. At its heart, it was a synergetic relationship, one that perhaps bent the rules a little, but worked for both of the interested parties. In an esports article, the author Riley commented that as long as he didn't stream from bathroom again, it was safe to assume that the doc won't be going anywhere in 2020. <laughs> How wrong they were. And I'll just say this right now, champs. There's a reason why we're suing the fuck out of them, okay? Yes, my friends, today's mystery will investigate the slaying and subsequent aftermath of one of Twitch's most recognizable creators, with discourse surrounding the many postulators that have arisen since that time. However, to fully understand many of these discussions, it's important that we first set the scene. So allow me to take you all back to a simpler time. 2020. Yeah, I can't believe it was simpler than either. Don't get too nostalgic as you join me to investigate the disappearance of Dr. Disrespect. But you know what won't disappear? Your enjoyment of Raid Shadow Legends! Raid Shadow Legends is the best game ever made. With over 600 champions and riveting AAA gameplay, you'll love Raid Shadow Legends. Millions of champion combinations and endless dungeons to run through. You will never need to play another game in your life. I stopped eating and sleeping. Hey, why bother? I have Raid now. And if you, somehow, get bored of raiding dungeons, you can beat the shit out of people in the PvP mode and become THE Shadow Legend. My favorite Shadow Legends are Herndig, because he is a dwarf and he can nuke everyone. I also like Gorgorab, because I mean, come on, look at him. Gorgrib and Herndig are also married. Right now, Raid is hosting a spooky Halloween event. They have plenty of in-game and IRL prizes, like a 1,000 Amazon gift card. You could buy Herndig a gift with that. The event only runs until November the 5th, so be sure to get the game. Go, go, what are you waiting for? Get it now! If you want to consume the most influential piece of media since Homer's Odyssey, then use this link in the description or the QR code screen to download the game and get a free starter pack worth $30. <gasps> That's $30 you can spend on Erndick. You can find me raiding Shadow Legends in-game under the name The Left Opinion. And if you love Herndig enough, you may even be able to join my Herndig fan club clan. See you there, gamers! Ad over. Hey there, just going over the last few drafts, thought I'd put an epilepsy warning here. Certain parts of this edit were a bit vibrant. And better to be safe than sorry. So if you do consider yourself susceptible to epileptic fits, then maybe wise to just put this one on for the audio until the next part. Now, I've already outlined the status of Dr. Disrespect at the start of 2020. He was creating content for adoring fans, and everything seemed fairly ordinary on that front. However, there had been some tension stir between platforms around that time. I've already mentioned YouTube's streaming feature, but I also noted that, as opposed to Twitch, it wasn't their primary selling point. However, around this time, there was another player in the market, which had shook up the industry a little. The name of this player was Mixer. 
Mixer was a relatively new online service, launched in 2016 under the name Beam. Not too long after, it was brought by Microsoft and rebranded for the global stage. Microsoft harbored great ambitions with this platform, gradually expanding the range of available services, streaming included. Arguably, though, the most significant development was in 2019, where renowned streamer Ninja, or Tyler Blevins, announced he would be leaving Twitch to join Mixer on an exclusive deal. I know this may come as a shock to many of you, but as of today, I will be streaming exclusively on Mixer. This caused quite the commotion at the time, with many pointing the finger at a variety of sources, including Twitch themselves for supposedly harboring a toxic environment that Blevins no longer wished to tolerate. Ninja was not the only streamer to leave Twitch for the market competitor though. Among others, FBS streamers Shroud, Ewok, and King Athalian also migrated platforms on an exclusive deal, and in this time Mixer reported a notable increase in hours of content streamed on their platform, appearing to win over new and aspiring creators from their rival streaming service. This would have inevitably put a squeeze on the bigwigs over at Twitch. Within a platform to poach their creators, they would need to approach each controversy with a heightened sensitivity to the consequences of their decisions. This would obviously not be a popular decision with some, but with one of the tech behemoths breathing down their throat, it seemed like the only viable option. In the meantime, there were questions surrounding who the next big name would be, perhaps XQC, Pokimane, or maybe Dr. Disrespect. Let's say, let's say a move for the doc to Mixer. Let's just like theoretically say, right? Um, the number would, be ha would have to be crazy. Like, I'm talking, I, but like, I, I don't know what Ninja got, but it's gotta be at Ninja's level or higher. I mean, it's just a big, stronger brand, right? <laughs> huh? It would have to be. In August, Streamy appeared to have little regard for what platform he streamed on, stating that his patronage would go to the highest bidder. Though a few months later, after the news that more streamers had left Twitch, he was confronted by audience members once more, wondering if he would be part of the large exodus to the up-and-coming platform. However, he appears to shoot these rumors down fairly swiftly, using his business acumen to point out the problems with the service in reference. Easy button, move to Mixer. I would never move to Mixer, trust me. Uh, it's stupid. Right now, they probably have maybe a total of 40 to 50,000 concurrent viewers across the entire platform. Right now, currently on Twitch, right now, currently across the entire platform, concurrent, 1.5 million concurrent viewers, right? So you tell me, you step into my face and say, yeah, they're making big moves. No, they're not, right? Like, I have double the amount of viewers that Ninja has right now, and I'm still in my intro, right? Reality check. Those moves, they're not doing anything for the platform. You can't pay for a community. You can't buy viewership. It's right here. The, the Twitch community, it's built on video games. It's built on communities. And you know what? The Doc's reservations were slowly being proven correct, because not all was completely steady on the Mixer ship. And although more content than ever was being streamed on the site, the actual viewership numbers were waning, and the co-founders James Berm and Matt Salsamendi left in very quick succession. Although both their posts appeared to express optimism for the future of Mixer, attributing their departure to a mere change in personal priorities, it's hard to ignore the interrelation between the exit of these figureheads. As viewer traffic is arguably the most integral element to a website in that domain, the information regarding Regarding their numbers was not a good sign. As a matter of fact, by the end of 2019, their market share still only equaled Facebook gaming. And at that point, I'm pretty sure most people on Facebook don't even know how to use that. However, though they weren't experiencing great success in that moment, their presence and their ostensible ambition was enough of a threat to provoke action from other players in the market. This threat wasn't just limited to Mixer or YouTube either though. Although I joke about it, Facebook Gaming did poach a couple streamers for their site, and another more controversial fringe site called DLive did sign a brief deal with PewDiePie in 2019. And though that was due to expire pretty soon, it could have definitely ruffled some feathers. In response to these hawkish business techniques, both Twitch and YouTube sought to cement their status with a variety of commercial deals. In Twitch's case, this included lucrative contracts with the creators themselves, such as Pokimane, Dr. Lupo, and of course, Dr. Disrespect, who in spite of pledging loyalty to the platform the year before, clearly brought an enable presence to the network. On March the 12th of 2020, Dr. Disrespect tweeted out a video from his account promoting the stream platform once more and emphasizing the exclusivity of his presence only on Twitch. You know the biggest difference between me and you, boys? Is that I can fly without space.
The contract was for two years, and although no specific figures were disclosed, it was definitely no Mickey Mouse Monopoly money to say the least. In an interview, the doc himself described it as life-changing, and it made perfect sense. It was true he was one of their most successful streamers, but he was more than that in a way. I mean, it's just a big, stronger brand, right? <laughs> A lot of the most viewed streamers are defined by their in-game skill or just on the basis of the content they engage with, especially those in the more reaction-oriented genre. The problem is that when your success is based on the relevance of the game or videos that fuel your content, you're often placing an expiry date when those games or those videos fall out of favor with the greater audience. Dr. Disrespect was more than that. He was a character. A divisive one for sure, but you don't garner prestige a lot of the time without making a few enemies. And sometimes it's better as a creator to evoke a strong reaction, positive or negative, because it's what will keep some people coming back. Sure, when he dropped a hot take or dissed another streamer, it would typically end up in an article, even drawing some negative press towards him. But he was always described as the Twitch streamer. And if any coverage was good coverage, then he was the prime example of that. I think Twitch identified the longevity in Dr. Disrespect's appeal and sought to secure it on their platform. With the competition gearing up for the new year, it made perfect sense that they retained one of their most identifiable creators. What could ever change that? Well, I don't know. Okay, that is the part over, and if you chose to listen to audio for that part, you may now resume watching, hopefully. June 2020 was a chaotic month to say the least, for everyone who could possibly be involved in this serpentine story. Despite their strong corporate foundations, Mix was faltering in views. A March report showed that although livestream viewership had doubled over the year before, Mix's growth tallied at 0.2%, which with their exorbitant financial deals considered, was nothing less than astounding. Astoundingly bad. When June came around, they appeared to be coming to terms with the fact that their platform was not sustainable with its expenditure, and on the 22nd of June, Mixer announced they were shutting down. This should have been great news for Twitch, who could recapture some of their creators who had previously exited the platform. However, this positive news was also being overshadowed by a series of criticism directed at Twitch and prominent gaming figures from female streamers who believe that Twitch's current system enabled misogyny and harassment on the platform, with many female streamers sharing their stories of unsavory experiences with those in the industry. With the CEO pledging to listen and cooperate in every way possible, it was a pretty challenging time for the platform and the online community as a whole, but all seemed committed to seeing it through, with new policy designed to take permanent action against those who committed these misdeeds in reference. Earlier in the month, Twitch had also been under pressure following a series of DMCA takedowns issued against a variety of channels relating to copyrighted music being used in streams and their potential legal liability, with their company Twitter account posting a statement expressing respect for these laws. Dr. Disrespect was not someone whose name had been included amongst any of these discussions, and overall there was no controversy surrounding him at this time. In months before, he had been involved in a few incidents, most notably regarding content he'd shared during the start of COVID that many felt was inaccurate. Needless to say though, he's not a medical doctor, so most of the time what he said didn't seem to have any staying power outside a few response articles and tweets. Dr. Disrespect was arguably the last person to have any eyes cast on him at this time. He wasn't a part of any known narratives, he had distanced himself from Mix and other competitors, all while maintaining a steady schedule and viewership on the website that adoringly hosted him. Yet, on the 26th of June, 2020, all of that seemed to turn on its head. Link down below as well, that being the possibility of Dr. Disrespect out of nowhere being banned today in what could be a permanent Twitch ban. Yes, without even the slightest of warnings, announcements, or messages, Dr. Disrespect's Twitch page went dark and for the first day left people scrambling for an explanation on what exactly happened. Twitch would not comment, and someone questioned whether he'd even been banned because of the lack of commentary around it. The day after, video games journalist Rod Slasher Breslau claimed that he had been informed as to why the doc had his platform withdrawn, but considered the reasons too legally sensitive to disclose at this point. He was one of the first to break the news of Dr. Disrespect's permanent ban, and his background in journalism seemed to give him some authority on the matter. However, he was not the only person to claim to be in the know, though nobody who did seemed interested in sharing this knowledge, making this whole premise somewhat dubious. On the same day, Twitch released a statement to CNN's Shannon Lau, stating that they took appropriate action in response to a violation of their community guidelines, as is their process. Not the most believable given their track record, but maybe they had a good reason. However, the day after, the doc himself tweeted that he had been given no reason from Twitch as to why he had been banned, and if Dr. Disrespect wasn't going to find out, then there was no chance that any of the wide audiences were going to find out anytime soon either. On the same day, Disrespect's final minutes from his last stream on Twitch were uploaded to YouTube, prompting many viewers to comb through to try and find any indication or foreshadowing of the trouble that followed. With that said, 
I have yet to see someone. That's on my fucking level, baby. Many viewers seem to note that Doc's demeanor visibly altered after the two minute mark, where he appears to check his phone following what was a presumed notification. So I should just put it on just chatting. I mean, like, I kind of wanted to get off, but now I don't want to get off. He goes on a brief inspirational spiel about his fan base and how they got to stay resolute before going off on a tangent about David Icke, a former footballer and commentator turned conspiracy theorist, who advocates for the idea that the world has been taken over by a reptilian elite who are veering the world towards a global fascism, hell-bent on eliminating all human freedoms. David Icke. Yes, Alex. Yes. I like him. All it allows you to do is just sort of like, you know, allows you to step outside of the box just a little bit. It had recently been censored on a variety of online platforms in response to his claims. However, the doc vocalizes his admiration of Ick's outside-of-the-box thinking. A strange turn of discourse, but not completely unfeasible. Though... Whether some of the stuff is not true or not, whatever. I think the whole, the whole goal, though, is... To WAKE UP! Yeah. Anyhow, someone recommends he play Roblox Hide and Seek next stream in his chat. The doc seems to pull it up, engage with some YouTube content on it, and maintain a rather stoic expression, only breaking the science to once more promote David Ick. He then appears to break character to talk directly to his fans with more motivational language and acknowledgement of some sort of unspecified challenge in his life. Okay, I appreciate everyone watching today. It in the backyard. Who is going to be looking? We'll, we'll get. Th we'll get through this Champions Club. Uh, it's, yeah, I know it's a tough. Because I don't know this one well. Life's weird right now. I. Who knows what he's exactly referring to? But before we know it, he appears to be interrupted, drops a cheeky expletive, and cuts the credits in. Dun dun dun! You better not taunt me. Oh, there you go. <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> Unsurprisingly, with a fair bit out of the ordinary going on here, many people began to speculate. Some more reasonable, some a little more far-fetched. But it represented the uncertainty in the Doc's world at this moment. He said he didn't know the reason for the ban, but there seems to be some recognition of an obstacle that appears to be troubling him during the stream. And the rather chaotic ending left many wondering if he'd been arrested or an even worse fate had befallen him, with Twitch being able to react accordingly with whichever authorities requested them to. Having the days following, no reports were released that corroborated this theory and Dr. Disrespect seemed to be at least alive. However, this didn't provide clarity for those seeking it, and if anyone was expecting a further explanation anytime soon, they were not going to receive it. The permanence of this ban was seemingly confirmed when Twitch refunded viewer subscription to the Doc's channel and eliminated his emotes. In the space of a few days, the seas of chaos and controversy seemed to part for this one man and his unrevealed breach of Twitch's conditions. So much was changing around the dock in that moment that it was hard to assign a causality to anything clear. And although some had some pretty solid theories, there was a lack of confirmation that planted the seed of uncertainty. Would the silence ever be broken? Well, let's find out. Over the following weeks, there was silence from the parties involved. Some articles were published and some hypotheses shared on the dock's fate. Yet most of this was hearsay, and with nobody willing to speak on the matter, very little progress was made. How this changed around mid-July, when our friendly PC physician decided to publish a somewhat foreboding trailer onto his Twitter. There's not really too much to read into here, but I think everyone figured that the doc had unfinished business. On the same day, he granted interviews to both PC Gamer and the Washington Post relating to the state of affairs that concerned his removal and the aftermath, including possible courses of action. In these interviews, Disrespect continues to emphasize that he is still none the wiser as to why Twitch terminated his contract. However, he seems reluctant to entertain any theories or provide any further details on his perspective. At one point in the PC Gamer interview, he begins responding to a question about the stream comments that touched on COVID misinformation. However, before he can elaborate on what he thinks, he's interrupted by his publicist who believes they're entering risky territory, and the question is shut down. 
One of the most significant details revealed in these interviews was that the doc was seeking counsel for possible legal action, part of the reason why he is not particularly forthcoming with many details relating to his ban as of then. One thing he does want to distance himself from is the behavior in his final stream, affirming that the two incidents are unrelated and that he was just feeling the pressure from the world around him at that moment. He acknowledges it was a curious coincidence, but assures interviewers that he was genuinely ignorant to what was about to transpire and that he still is. It's hard to fully take his word at face value, but there isn't really much else to take at this point, so this is the best that most could settle for. There was another lull in developments with the occasional cryptic posts here and there. On July 22nd, a few days after the interviews, one of Dr. Disrespect's top Discord mods shared an old message which seemed to imply that something was in the works, though no further specifics were provided. Lo and behold though, barely a fortnight later, the prophecies were fulfilled, with a Twitter post from the doc himself announcing his return. Tomorrow we arrive, with a link to a video uploaded to YouTube. Now, with his previous video also being uploaded onto YouTube, some had already thought this would be the platform of choice, but this seemed to confirm it even if it wasn't outwardly stated. The second was a music video accompanying a song by J Plus One, a regular collaborator with the doc, in which he seems to provide the vocals here. The lyrics include the line, I don't even know why I try anymore, repeated multiple times, and you can't replace me remarks that seem applicable to Twitch's recent measures taken against him. In this video, he's seen in a dark room, looking over an inclement skyline while serenading the bright lights, reaching out but never quite reaching them. Okay, I'll try not to get too artsy here, but there seems to be a lot of subliminal messages on show, but the most important one was the tweet itself, referring to tomorrow. This was the date set for his grand return, with many anticipating what he might finally reveal now he has a platform once more, albeit a new one. What would he say? We have no idea. And I'm going to tell you this right now. As far as I'm concerned, we didn't do anything to warrant a ban, let alone how they went about banning us. No communication before, no reaching out, nothing. Boom, done. Well, nothing particularly new in its core message, that boils down to the fact that he still doesn't know what he has done wrong and that it had not been communicated to him. But it's certainly a lot more convincing when delivered with the trademark bravado that people had come to know the doc for. He also once more criticizes those who have jumped to conclusions on the nature of his ban, expressing understanding that although people may be looking for an answer, sometimes one doesn't come too easily and that it'd be best left with the professionals for now. The problem is too, there's people in the community that are anxious for an answer and so what that does it it, it creates a level of uh, urgency and speculation and i think it's just a fucking cockroach approach there's big money involved so let the legal professionals do what they need to do that's it now this is a fair way to close discussion on the matter for the moment, he is a streamer with his own persona to maintain, he can't let this drama be the defining aspect of his long and illustrious career. However, his response is also revealing in the fact that it shows he's still exploring legal options and clearly believes he may have a strong case to make for himself. Provided what he said in that moment is the case, then of course he would. However, I wouldn't be giving the stream its due credit if I focused on a rather derisory portion of it. Let me make this clear, this video is more than that, it's a stone cold statement. You all better pay some fucking attention because Dr. Disrespect was back. And this time, he was intent on not going anywhere. I'm gonna stay here and just watch him on the stream the whole time. <laughs> I'm gonna wait right here underneath the fucking staircase. And I'm gonna wait. And I'm gonna screen watch. I'm gonna stare at him. And I'm gonna with its duration exceeding an entire day and a view count surpassing 7 million, the doc buckled down to some classic gamer antics providing the fans more of what they knew him for. 
and the abundance of video games, banter, and one-liners to boot. Unfortunately, due to its protracted length, the video is no longer available to watch in its entirety, though the doc did upload a little highlight reel for all those who missed the first stage of his new journey. You can also find parts of the stream on other channels that caught it, so you can enjoy the moment one more time. No, I ain't coming. I ain't coming back. This felt good in many ways for his audience. This was his homecoming. Sure, it was a new home, but it was the same furniture. It was a new chapter, yet the same book. Over the year, he grew his viewer base on YouTube, continuing his collaboration with other creators and studios, even appearing to plan his own entry into the video games market. Everything was progressing fairly smoothly, and the incident that the doc described as a speed bump seemed to be firmly in the rearview mirror. And yet, in spite of this, he couldn't help glancing back. Don't be mistaken, there was a lot to celebrate for members of the Champions Club. How this was also still deeply bittersweet. Although he had found a new platform, the legacy of the past controversy still casts a long and dark shadow. I know nobody's probably going to shed a tear over the state of his finances, the dude probably does alright for himself. But proportionally speaking, he lost a lot. And a channel. It still holds a lot of emotional value, value that he clearly felt attached to. There's no streaming community on YouTube, okay? I'll be straight up, like... Streaming on YouTube, it's it's terrible. There's no community. Uh, if I play Apex, Jesus Christ. I mean, I, I'm going to have to, like, market my stream in newspaper ads or something in order for someone to, to, to come across it. That's why I don't play Apex. This was something unprecedented for him, let alone everyone else, and he wanted closure. How was he going to do that? Well, uh, whether it's obvious or not, the blacklisting, the shadow banning, it's happening. Um, and it's as, as well as you think we're doing. And I think we, again, we're, we're doing well enough. I'll tell you, man, it's been extremely disheartening. It's been, it's been a roller coaster of emotion and it's absolutely fucking sucks. Over a year passed since any progress on legal proceedings had been announced, and for some, the case had probably gone cold. However, in August of 2021, while responding to a question in a fairly casual stream, the doc had some news to impart for his eager viewers. After talking about how his Twitch ban had impacted him and his business, he revealed some new information regarding his ban. But a lot of people ask me, do, do you know the reason? Yeah, I do know the reason why now. I've known for months now the reason why. And I'll just say this right now, champs. There's a reason why we're suing the fuck out of them, okay? Uh, I don't know how else to put it. The amount of damages and, and you just don't... No. No. Um. Gotta... For a second, I... I, I. Anyways. This was the first time that Dr. Disrespect publicly stated he knew why he had been banned, alongside the fact that he was taking legal action. It was only a single sentence, but news outlets rushed to cover it with a plethora of postulations about the rationale behind this decision. However, if he initiated a lawsuit, one thing was true. He believed he had a case. What did that case constitute? Well, my friends, I think it's high time we bring in our resident Twitch expert into this discussion as well. And I know what you're thinking. You have a resident Twitch expert? How come we've never met him? Well, he's a hardworking guy, and he's also allowed only one hour sunlight a week. So if he exceeds that in this video, we'll be having words. Ladies, gentlemen, and all far and wide, allow me to introduce you to my good friend Poutine, who will be looking into Twitch's legal liabilities and the prospective case our streamer friend possessed. Take it away, my man. When I first learned about Dr. Disrespect's ban, like many others, I was baffled. How could Twitch ban one of their biggest creators and not even tell them why? After a couple years of streaming on Twitch, that answer has become a lot more clear. One thing you need to understand about Twitch is they care a lot about maintaining a professional public image. The last thing Twitch wants is to be seen caught up in some petty drama regarding somebody's ban. As a result, they've created PR and support teams that rival YouTube and how unhelpful and robotic they can be. Their policy when banning streamers, regardless of size or context, is not to make comments of any kind. 
public or private. This includes giving streamers themselves specific reasons for their ban. For example, Twitch used to send out templates that look like this whenever somebody got banned. If you were lucky, a vague reason would be given, with a simple link to their community guidelines to, quote, learn more. If you weren't so lucky, sometimes you wouldn't be given a reason at all. The fate of any wrongdoers on the platform is decided by a very small, completely anonymous moderation team, and they have notoriously tight lips. Doc not being given a reason for his ban wasn't an exception. It was the rule. It feels like every month there's a new streamer getting banned without a clear reason, and beyond making a few tweets, most take this sort of treatment sitting down. But not the Doc. He had something so strong it was worth suing a multi-billion dollar company over. What was it? I've spent the past week reading California state law. That is to say it's not been a very fun week, and I think I've narrowed it down. Before we understand Dr. Disrespect's lawsuit, we first need to understand how Twitch's contracts work. On YouTube, there's one partner program for everybody on the platform. Twitch, on the other hand, has a multi-tiered system. On the lowest levels are affiliates, above them are partners, and above them is a more secretive tier of top creators who have personalized contracts with Twitch. In order to get one of these more exclusive contracts, streamers often negotiate directly with Twitch for things like higher revenue splits and a flat payout for streaming a certain number of hours every month. Dr. Disrespect no doubt had one of these contracts. With that in mind, the first conclusion many people came to regarding the lawsuit was a breach of that contract. Perhaps Twitch had in some way violated the terms of their own contract. Now I'm gonna level with you here. Knowing the specifics of Doc's contract is virtually impossible. Twitch keeps all of their agreements under NDA. But that doesn't mean we have nothing to go off of. Going into 2016, James Varga, better known as Phantom Lord, was on the top of his career. You might not know his name today, but he was once the most followed streamer on Twitch. He would routinely stream himself gambling CSGO skins on several different sites and winning big. Unfortunately for him, it came out that one of these sites was not only rigged in his favor, but it was created by him. For Twitch, this was the last straw, as he had already violated their terms of service in the past, and I'm guessing the whole running an illegal gambling operation thing uh, probably didn't really help his case. Phantom Lord was banned in July of that year, and two years later in early 2018, Phantom Lord filed a lawsuit against Twitch. He was suing them for violating California's unfair competition laws, breach of contract, and intentional and negligent misrepresentation. Alike Dr. Disrespect, Phantom Lord claimed he was entitled to millions. My case is looking towards 35 million plus um, in damages, and that's that's like minimum. We can break down his claims into one of two categories, which violated specific terms of their contract, and Twitch mishandled the ban, causing damages to Phantom Lord. For the first category, the court sided with Phantom Lord. Within his contract was a provision that guaranteed him 30 days notice if Twitch were to ban him. Twitch failed to do this and was ordered to pay just over $20,000 as a result. The second category, however, was a different story altogether. While it was obvious to many in the public why Phantom Lord had been banned, Twitch hadn't explicitly given him a reason until five months after afterward. Sound familiar? When he finally got through to a Twitch representative, he was told the ban was the result of fraudulent payments being made to his channel, an allegation that many in the media were already acutely aware of. The reason for his ban was later seemingly changed to reflect the gambling site scam he ran, among other guideline violations. He argues that Twitch misrepresented their terms of service to him, and that by banning him in the manner they did, Twitch's business practices are unfair. The courts agreed with some aspects of his claims, but ultimately sided with Twitch, and Phantom Lord was never unbanned. On paper, Phantom Lord came out on top, $20,000 richer. But it's important to point out that this lawsuit lasted for over three years, and it didn't get anywhere near the millions of dollars he claimed he was owed. Given that this case was the closest legal battle to what Dr. Disrespect was about to go through, and Twitch had no doubt changed their contract since, the odds of winning anything substantial must have seemed slim at best. But Doc still had one more ace up his sleeve. You see, when Twitch terminated their contract with Doc, he lost a lot more than just what that contract entailed. Third-party sponsors and events immediately backed out of any deals with him, seemingly out of a fear of association, despite not even knowing why he was banned in the first place. But the Twitch ban is really, how it's really affected us, not just from a financial standpoint, but from a, from a networking standpoint, from all the relationships we've built over the past five years and in terms of Activision and EA, I mean, everyone, all the big sponsors, all the big partnerships, they have to question, why did you get banned? 
Right. Whether it's obvious or not, the blacklisting, the shadow banning, it's happening. Speculation ran wild, and the safest thing for these brands to do was to distance themselves. From the outside looking in, there was a degree of weight to Doc's ban. It seemed so serious that nobody felt comfortable even discussing it. I mean, maybe the reason for the ban was trivial, but none of these brands wanted to stick around and find out. Doc losing these deals and partnerships that were made independently of Twitch as a result of how Twitch handled things seems a bit unfair. But it's more than just unfair. It's illegal. Tort is a category of civil law that focuses on emotional, physical, or economic damages caused. Within this category is something called negligent interference with prospective economic relations. This complete jumble of words was his golden ticket. While simple contract violations got Phantom Lord $20,000, this could get Doc a whole lot more. In order to win the lawsuit in California, where Twitch is based, Doc would have to prove eight points. First, that there was a relationship between him and his sponsor, with the possibility of future income. That Twitch knew about this relationship. That Twitch knew Doc's relationship would be damaged if they failed to act with reasonable care. That Twitch did not act with reasonable care. That Twitch engaged in wrongful conduct. This one is a bit of a mystery, but it could be a number of things, from breach of contract to slander or misrepresentation or any other the wrongful act that Twitch might have done towards Doc relating to his ban. That Doc's relationship with a sponsor was actually damaged, and that Doc was economically harmed as a result. It would be easy to argue that Twitch knew about his sponsorships, and knew banning Doc in such a secretive manner would harm those sponsorships. Instead of clarifying the reason for the ban, Twitch allowed theories to run wild. I don't know about you, but to me, this doesn't seem like reasonable care to somebody who was one of their biggest creators. And if the courts agreed, millions of dollars in damages were on the table. In Phantom Lord's case, his lawyers did mention that Twitch caused him serious monetary and reputational damage. But interestingly, they didn't seem to pursue those claims further, possibly because they knew his reputation and job opportunities were already damaged before the ban by countless articles and videos documenting his actions. In short, he burned those bridges just fine without any help from Twitch. The same can't be said for Dr. Disrespect, however. In his case, the ban blindsided both his partners and the public alike. Look, I'll be the first to admit there's no short shortage of reasons to sue somebody in the US. And to be honest with you, Doc could be suing Twitch for pretty much anything. But if Doc had any real chance of getting the millions of dollars he claimed Twitch took from him, it was in this convoluted and wordy section of California law. The road ahead did not look easy for Doc. He was going up against one of the biggest companies in the world with one of the most well-funded legal teams. Despite this, he was confident, though it remained to be seen if this confidence was misplaced. Wow, what an eloquently spoken chap. Only a true genius would have the artistic inspiration to feature them in a video of theirs. Anyhow, I shan't stand on ceremony any further. Regards to the specifics, Dr. Dispet believed he had a case. And with the details behind this exclusive contract, it's understandable why he held that belief. But belief is only half the battle. Those looking at his case would need to share his perspective. And when dealing with these online situations, there's often an element of unpredictability. Nevertheless, going into the new year, his resolutions were a bit more ambitious. At the start of this saga, he expressed no intent on returning to Twitch following his ban. However, entering 2022, this had changed, with a large payout and a grand return part of his yearly aims. He clearly had an expectation that this lawsuit would yield a favorable result for him. And given the far-reaching impact that his rejection had onto his finances, if the grounds for his removal were found to be unfounded, then surely he would be entitled to serious compensation. And we've gotten to such a good point, ladies and gentlemen, Champions Club. We got to such a good point. I mean, I'm talking all cylinders firing. The conscious just feels extremely just incredible. And then to have that taken away from you and to not know why and to not know anything about it, not to be told nothing. Boom, taken, grabbed. Everything we built, all the eggs in one bucket. Boom, taken away. The fact that I am here live on YouTube, it's been a fantastic return, I'm telling you, it is. But my anxiety levels are, are, are it's something that comes in these huge waves and I'm, I'm having a hard time dealing with it. I'll, I'll be right, I'll be honest. However, did Twitch have a case to make as well? Dr. Disrespect always pushed the boundaries of what was acceptable on the platform, and even if it wasn't their honest reason for banning him, could they refer to these instances as factors for nullifying a contract, and find loopholes with such a known provocateur? The fact that Twitch weren't just taking it lying down seemed to imply that they also believed they had a case too. But what was the reality? 
Well, after a couple months of further litigation, an announcement was made on behalf of both Dr. Disrespect and Twitch. These statements were nearly identical, both conveying that the parties had come to a settlement, although neither of them admit any fault for their parts. In a way, this result is not surprising. Lawsuits can be lengthy and arduous, incurring great costs for all. And if conditions that each person involved is satisfied with can be agreed upon, then that is nearly always more preferable than rolling the dice in court. However, in a follow-up comment to his initial statement, the doc clarifies he will not be returning to Twitch, seemingly contradicting his post a couple months prior. Had anything changed in that time? Or was this case not quite as strong as he believed it to be? While it's hard to read too much into it, on the surface, some might assume Dr. Disrespect's case wasn't compelling enough for him to follow through on. We know he perceives Twitch as the superior platform for streaming, and as a long-term result, his return to the platform may have been financially preferable given his impressive viewership. As Putin noted, another lawsuit that had resulted in a plaintiff victory yielded an amount that probably didn't go particularly far. And although Twitch probably did breach aspects of their contract, this complaint probably wouldn't yield the payout that the doc was hoping for, even if proven. The money was in the implication of Twitch's actions, which is what the doc seemed focused on. Since, since the purple snake scummy ban, um... We've had a hit. We've taken a hit on so many different things behind the scenes, champs. We've taken a hit on so many things, not just the, the contract, the original contract. However, proving that would have been a greater challenge. As noted, some critics may have viewed the settlement as a reflection of weakness in Dr. Disrespect, or his case. After all, he was not prepared to follow through with it, and actually acquire the desired result. However, this didn't necessarily reflect a weak case. It really depends on the details of the settlement, details that we will probably never know. If the payout offered to him was large enough, he might have just taken that deal and gone his own way. I don't think the doc had a weak case in regards to how Twitch handled their severance of him. They clearly dealt with it poorly, but that wasn't where the money was. The following part is mostly theory, but I think it's worth exploring a little, and it is based on the assumption that what the doc was banned for wasn't quite as shocking as certain figures had suggested it was. I think the greatest financial damage in the doc's mind came in the aftermath, and its persisting presence on his ability to attend events and garner sponsorships. Anybody who's banned from Twitch is also restricted from attending events for which Twitch may be affiliated with and appearing on any other creator's Twitch streams. We don't know exactly on what grounds Dr. Disrespect sued, but we can estimate that it was probably in the domain that tort allows. Although there are a few routes he could have taken, he wasted a decent amount of time to file the lawsuit, despite exploring it from pretty much the onset of his banishment, which would imply that they wanted to let the dust settle and the upshot to show itself with clarity. At the start, some had considered the additional publicity that he received as actually a positive result given that many people sympathized with his situation. However, over time, that sympathy faded and the financial ramifications became clear because of how dominant Twitch truly are on the market. I mean, there's a reason why Activision doesn't do a Call of Duty partner code or we don't work directly with Call of Duty or haven't been. There's so much defamation relating to the ban that we've had to deal with. It's insane. These were strong words, but they were ones that emphasized the damage that Twitch had caused to Dr. Disrespect. He needed to drive this home to people, and he was smart about it in many ways. Part of me thinks that Twitch were hoping that the doctor following his ban would have angrily taken to stream and revealed details that would have been detrimental in his court case, but he didn't. In interviews, he focused on the damage, but not the details. He spoke about the mental anguish, and although I have no doubt he experienced that, his focus on that was important to drive home the point that Twitch's actions caused visible harm. To me, there was little question that Dr. Disrespect had proven that Twitch's actions had tangible negative consequences on his mobility in the industry and his own mental state in dealing with the evolution evolving circumstances. Twitch played an undeniable role in this. Sure, they didn't want to show their hand too soon in case people quickly countered them and undermined their reasoning for the doc's ban. However, in this case, as Putin noted, beyond their direct involvement with many other companies, their ambiguity prompted uncertainty within brands who would typically partner with our streamer friend in question. When you're a large company, the last thing you want is someone who is an unknown quantity. And for a while, Dr. Disrespect was just that. Even brands he shared well-established relationships with distanced themselves, and although some returned in time, it was demonstrative of how ignorance could be weaponized as much as any form of knowledge. But surely that would depend on whether Dr. Disrespect's removal from the platform was justified. 
Twitch's statement on Dr. Disrespect's ban, as in our process, we take appropriate action when we have evidence that a streamer has acted in violation of our community guidelines or terms of service. These apply to all streamers, regardless of status or prominence in the community. I suppose. I mean, of course, if that statement was found to lack sufficient merit, then they could have been in hot water. However, I'm sure Twitch had considered that and probably assembled a reason that they could defend themselves with in the scenario that the doc took them to court. Nonetheless, even if they did find a few breaches of contract or guidelines to use against our disrespectful friend, would they be completely in the clear? Well, you're entering tricky territory because if he was banned for a justified reason, then Twitch's statement on the matter wouldn't necessarily be false. It also depends on their actual reasoning behind the ban. We're going to explore theories very soon, but there are a variety of violations that the doc could have been banned from Twitch for, yet probably wouldn't have been too affected by in other parts of the community. If they had been revealed, even if they were still fair reasons for Twitch's perspective, he likely would have experienced less impact to his business. In this case, you could feasibly prove that Twitch's failure to disclose any reason had a worse impact than actually disclosing a reason, which included lesser breaches. This is what this is all about. This is the reason Joshua Holcomb was pulled over. New Mexico statute 66-3-846, driving with an obstructed window. This morning, I did an informal survey of the courthouse parking lot, and by my count, over a third of the vehicles had something similar hanging from their rearview mirrors. So, unless you and 47 of our colleagues have outstanding tickets, I'd argue that this statute is not regularly enforced. I know this isn't the most academic reference, but there's a brief scene in the new season of Better Call Saul where lawyer Kim Wexler illustrates how attentive law had been selectively applied against one of her clients in a discriminatory fashion. Your Honor, this was a perfectly reasonable, routine stop for cause. This was not routine. Officer Connell knew my client. In fact, he arrested him five years ago. And Officer Connell's record shows that this is only the third citation he's written for this statute in almost 20 years. So either this is an incredible coincidence or Officer Connell recognized my client and used the dangler as a pretext to violate his Fourth Amendment rights. So that even if it was technically correct, it's poor enforcement had indulged a culture that normalized that behavior. I think within reason, you could easily make the same argument against Twitch. In this case, Dr. Suspect may have felt he had pretty strong grounds to file a lawsuit. And even if Twitch were happy with their reasoning behind the ban, they may have also been very hesitant to roll the dice in court this time round. Because although in previous cases they had probably given viewers enough to go off when working out reasons for a ban, even if not overtly stated, here it was all rather up in the air, particularly given their inconsistent record on actually disciplining other creators, who similarly pushed the envelope. Make no mistake, Dr. Disrespect is not your ideal Twitch creator. He's not entirely unproblematic. It wouldn't be particularly difficult to compile a file of all the numerous times he pushed the stick a little too far for some people's liking. Yet, Twitch's continuous and even renewed consent for his presence on the platform set a standard in his mind that he thought was acceptable. The moments where he was arguably at his most audacious was in many people's minds the moments where he was most in character. The possibility is that Twitch's failure to distinguish that and impose standards consistently could have undermined the solidity of their own guidelines. But why would they do that in the first place? The greatest question that has pervaded this case is why? Why was Dr. Disrespect banned? I think we're at a point where we may have to accept that we will never know for certain, and that is the case for a lot of situations. If you're not there, it's hard to exactly know what happened. Nonetheless, it's one of those instances where there isn't really even a vague consensus of what exactly inspired Twitch to take action. Theories wildly range from the most severe transgressions to minor and petty motivations that would surprise everyone. Why can't we think of a proper reason and agree on it? Well, I think there are a few factors at play that we can pin down. The first is, and this one's quite obvious, consistency. Twitch's failure to enforce rules consistently didn't just affect creators, but affected an audience understanding of the Twitch rules as well. Unless you're very accustomed with the platform, I'm sure that many people here wouldn't know if some of Dr. Disrespect's more irreverent behavior was even in breach of the rules. And even if we could, we could probably also think of times where people weren't punished for the exact same transgression. If a large majority of creators wouldn't be punished for it, why would a creator as universal as Dr. Disrespect be? Other than explaining that the doc was banned for a contravention of the guidelines, the Twitch statement also subtly implies that said guidelines are consistent. Whether this was an attempt to try and set the standard that their rules have been applied fairly to try and cover for the fact that they were acutely aware that they weren't is not really for me to say, but it's a curious detail that I think is worth observing. 
We know the Twitch is not the most consistent, but something must have changed in the months running up to the Docs ban that ultimately led to his removal from the platform. Well, as mentioned earlier on in the video, there were some changing circumstances that could have altered Twitch's stance on their creators. Twitch couldn't attribute the changing environment alone to their decision in taking the two time off the platform. However, deep down, given everything going on, it felt like it must have played a role. The ongoing discussion surrounding the industry's problem with the treatment of women had led some to draw a connection between the two. But I think the even more significant development was the retreat of Mixer and their aggressive tactics. Now, Mixer was never the greatest threat to the market, but the way they went about their business certainly was, and the nature to poach large creators, if anything, disrupted the ecosystem in an unfavorable way. I also think the presence of aggressive competition made Dr. Disrespect one of Twitch's most valuable creators, because he commanded a loyal audience and a unique appeal that would probably follow him to another platform, many of whom subsequently did. Now, ultimately, with what we know, he couldn't have been absolutely indispensable, and some may point out the fact that when he left, he actually went to a more competitive platform platform the Mixer, and I'd say that's a fair point. However, his departure at a sensitive time definitely could have swung momentum in a way that other creators failed to do so. A narrative had formed that maybe this was the end of Twitch's market domination, and someone like the Doc going to another platform could have easily fueled that. In hindsight, even if Mixer's statistics showed they never really posed that much of a menace, their demise allowed Twitch to retain that symbolic stranglehold on the market, allowing them to act with more confidence and ruthlessness. It seems that regardless of the actual reason behind Dr. Disrespect, ban, it was more a result of the evolving circumstances around Twitch, who either felt compelled to do something in that specific moment or felt like they finally had the freedom to. There is a ton of speculation out there, and that's all it is right now. It's complete and utter speculation. You know, it is the elephant in the room. We have to put it out there, and we also have to say, we just don't know. This meant that when reviewing the case, people didn't really have much of a pattern to work with. They didn't have an established rulebook for Twitch and they struggled to decipher what about the doc's behavior was exceptional in the run up to his ban. Wake up! Yeah, sure, his final stream was weird, his behavior erratic and narratives rather curious, but it's hard to really read too much into it. The most you could say is that it seems like he found out something and obviously didn't take it well. Whether that information was merely part of the Twitch situation, he wasn't prepared to talk about it, and in this instance, we can't really do much about it. Particularly given that it didn't really lead to much directly. He wasn't arrested, he wasn't sued, he was just banned from Twitch. And we still don't know for sure if the two are related or if the guy was just acting up a bit. There is a further factor to consider when trying to deconstruct audience amusement, and that being journalism and coverage surrounding the matter. Not too long after his ban, certain seemingly credible sources in the industry stated that they'd been informed as to why the doc had been banned, with many stating that the reason was really bad. However, if the reason was as serious as they framed it, why would he be left in the dark to the point where he is still essentially operating the way he previously did? Although these people seemed believable in their intent, it was hard to buy it without any accompaniment. And I'm not saying that I think these people were lying when they said they'd been informed of the supposed reason. I think it's very feasible they were told something, but nobody had the confidence in the reason they'd been told to actually say it. Slash himself said he was afraid of a defamation lawsuit, and when it's not your information, I can understand that. Nevertheless, defamation is only valid when the claim is false, and therefore it seems that many were aware that there could be an error within this reason, or a lack of supporting evidence to back up these claims if given proper scrutiny. Without uh, without the appropriate amount of uh, you have attacked me without the appropriate lied. amount of evidence. I mean, like to go to your point, I don't want to put it personally on Twitter, and I do need a publication to back me. But this requires indemnity that I want, and that has been rather difficult to acquire. And that means that I get legal protection from uh, the outlet that I publish for in from whatever would happen afterwards. So yes, a defamation suit. Eventually, many media sources seemed to retreat, saying, well, we're just as confused as you are, and the lead went cold. The focus on something more serious, particularly given the environmental circumstances at the time, served to add to the broad church of theories regarding Dr. Disrespect. The final factor, of course, is the fact that neither Twitch nor Dr. Disrespect ever even alluded to the reason. The closest we reached was the doc downplaying any industry and behavior and being interrupted by his publicist, but that was supposedly before he was aware of the reason himself. The fact that nobody said a thing implied to viewers that there had to be a benefit to not discussing it. And sure, the legal explanation is pretty comprehensive and it's possible that part of their out-of-court settlement was an agreement to not disclose this information. But there's that lingering sentiment that surely someone would say something if it was as clear-cut one way or the other. If it was so serious that the doc had to go, or if it was so serious the doc had to sue.
People have this insatiable desire to find out why, even when the answer isn't in front of us. Yet with all the factors considered, so many theories ran amok and clouded any attempt to really analyze each explanation on the basis of its merits. So why don't we do that now? There are a lot of theories, and obviously we can't cover every individual defining detail that makes each hypothesis unique. However, most of these speculations do share features, and we'll be focusing on the overarching narratives behind them, the arguments in favour, and against their likelihood. As with other parts, this is obviously not a definitive statement, and what actually happened may be completely different to anything we discuss here today. So with that in mind, let's start with the most unexceptional theories. That being, Dr. Disrespect committed a simple breach of the rules, and Twitch decided to ban him on that basis. How boring. But is it really that improbable? I mean, Dr. Disrespect had certainly received a bit of blowback for his statements surrounding COVID, and had certainly indulged some interesting antics, including claiming he had purchased Shungite to combat the alleged radiation from 5G, as advocated by some conspiracy theorists. There's a bigger agenda happening, a bigger, bigger agenda going on, man. I, I'm, I'm with Elon, like, I'll just say it, I'm with Elon Musk. It, like, look at the data, just, just look at it, man, and we are prolonging something, I just, just I gotta stop. Now, this can all be interpreted in good humor, but in a time where conspiracy theories were receiving a lot of harsh criticism, particularly given the pandemic, it's completely plausible that some at the top may have been rubbed the wrong way. Hell, in his final stream, he promotes David Icke, whose mention certainly would have turned a few heads on its own. Twitch had received a bit of flack from media sources for their inaction on conspiracy theories, with Kotaku mentioning the dot by name. It was clear there was a frustration in his behavior, even if it was part of the character. Maybe Twitch decided that they had to take action to send a message to other creators. However, was this even against the community guidelines? Well, nowadays it would be. However, back in 2020, the community guidelines only covered this on very vague terms, highlighting misinformation as a breach of the guidelines. However, not really saying too much about what that misinformation included. In fact, the examples they provide point towards misinformation in a different sense, more relating to how you present your channel on the platform, though it does list feigning distress as an example something that the doc may have been accused of in his final stream. At the same time, how would you prove something like that is feigned beyond a reasonable doubt? Without a confession, there's really no way you could. Would this have been enough to peg the doc? It's possible, but far from definitive. He was far from the only person discussing these theories, and surely if Twitch had merely spoken to him and communicated that they weren't happy with some of his behavior, he would have changed it accordingly. Many would argue that he committed worse transgressions on the platform and received lesser punishment. And if they were looking to make an example of him, Surely they would have emphasized the reason why he was banned. The owners of Twitch, Amazon, have a very sympathetic film on David Icke available on their website. It would seem a little hypocritical to say the least. So although possible, this alone probably would have put them in a bit of a tight spot, and they perceivably didn't have too much to gain from it, especially as the spotlight wasn't on the dock at the time. Lest we be reminded that despite reaching a settlement that Dr. Disrespect found satisfactory, it still didn't entail him returning to the platform like he aimed. They did not want him back. Surely a basic breach of the rules was not enough of a motivation on its own. Twitch needed to be looking out for themselves when they took this action. And this is where other theories can be introduced. Easy button, move to Mixer. I would never move to Mixer, trust me. As noted, the banning of Dr. Disrespect followed shortly after the collapse of competing streaming platform Mixer. Many have attributed Mixer's demise as a factor in the expulsion of the dock. But what if it wasn't just a factor, but the motive? I'm tired of already seeing the comments, ladies and gentlemen. Who's next, doctor? I was the first one there in Washington before this guy, before Shroud. They wanted the number one. A variety of theories have been expounded on this one. The simpler ones suggest that Dr. Disrespect had been expected to transfer to Mixer after a deal had been made behind closed doors, and the discontinuation of Mixer had caused this information to be leaked to the Twitch executives, who saw this deal as a breach of the contract signed by the doc. A more elaborate theory states that upon hearing about the dire straits faced by the Microsoft-owned platform, the prudent-minded businessman approached other large streamers on the website, including Ninja, with the mind to start a new Spotify backstream platform by the name of Brime, which suspiciously resembles 
Prime. Somehow this made it back to Twitch and once again they took action against our streamer friend. Another one advocated by some from the community suggests that the doc allegedly lied about offers from Mixer to receive more money from Twitch during contract negotiations. And once more, when Mixer shut down, Twitch found out and took action. Are there any merits to these sorts of theories? Well, it would certainly give Twitch a stronger motive to ban Dr. Disrespect. After all, his presence on the platform could have been used as leverage to encourage other creators and viewers to leave Twitch. Although it's questionable whether this behavior would have constituted a breach of the rules or even an exclusivity contract, they may have felt it more economically viable to ban him as they saw his presence as a liability. Dr. Disrespect's ban reduces his mobility in the community at least and may make it harder for him to set up any sort of competing service or go anywhere else. There's a long-term financial motive here. But is there anything else? Or is it just people trying to find a reason when there isn't one? First of all, the Brian theory didn't really seem to take off, mainly because Spotify themselves never seemed interested in launching that sort of service, and its source wasn't particularly strong. Brian, as a streaming website, did seem to have some credibility. They do have some social pages, but it never really went anywhere, and it's hard to see why the doc would be related to that, especially as they kept uploading promotional material after he had allegedly moved to YouTube. Dr. Disrespect going to mix at the end of its lifespan also seems pretty unlikely. The doc had already explained the problems with that sort of platform, and even if they had approached him when facing its own closure, which seems unlikely in itself, surely there was no way that the doc would have been able to ignore the signs that this was a company struggling, regardless of how much money they offered him. Probably the most plausible theories out of these is the one where he doesn't actually go anywhere, and he just utilized other supposed offers to haggle a good financial rate. But once again, is that something the doc would do? It's very hard to say. He was probably being offered a monumental amount of money anyway. Was it his time to get greedy? And would Twitch have really been gullible enough to believe a struggling company was offering big bucks? But all right, maybe we don't know the platform he was considering, but maybe he was just considering a move of sorts that annoyed Twitch. Well, I suppose, but the dude seemed genuinely happy at the platform and didn't seem like he wanted to upset that. I know you got to put on a persona, but even if this explanation gave Twitch a motive, it didn't really give Dr. Disrespect one. Why would he go to any other platform unless he was forced? We've spoken a lot about the reasons that Twitch may have to ban Dr. Disrespect, and many of them have and will harp on some sort of social motive, some sort of misconduct that causes them to take action. However, what if the motive was purely financial? Is it possible? Well, as we know, Mixer just shut down, and the dog had been given a very sizable offer to stay on the platform a few months prior. However, with Mixer's closure, the newfound availability of other large creators, and the decreased competitiveness of the market, could Twitch release a few bags by cutting ties with one of their most expensive investments, claiming it breached terms and conditions? and nullifying a pricey contract. Some have suggested that Twitch couldn't afford creators like Shroud or Ninja if they had retained the services of Dr. Disrespect. However, I don't think it would be the case of couldn't in this scenario. It's more likely to be a case of wouldn't. But would they? On one hand, this theory fits into the established timeline rather neatly and would provide a clear incentive for his removal and the DOP's subsequent reaction and lawsuit. However, there are also uncertainties. With the litigation considered, was it really that profitable a move for Twitch? Would it really have been so troublesome to see out a contract and retain a high-profile figure who drew viewers? And why wouldn't they let him back on the platform despite offering a payout? Surely there had to be a greater motive than breaking an undesirable contract with a creator whose longevity has outlasted many of his contemporaries. Well, let's entertain those now. As we know, Twitch was having a bit of an image crisis around this time, particularly with how they were presented in the media and how some of their industry executives have been caught behaving. I think the phrase toxic masculinity might come to the lips of some when analysing the culture that had prevailed for a long time. Dr. Disrespect had not been at the centre of the public conscience regarding this controversy, and maybe he had no reason to be. But in many ways, his behaviour did offend the sensibilities of some around him. Twitch clearly wanted to pride themselves on being a safer space for creators and to distance themselves from the traditional image of the toxic gamer. We had this discussion earlier with Ninja, who left the platform and subsequently criticized its toxicity. Like himself, a lot of people who may have been associated with that image had distanced themselves since, and even come to attack it. With large streamers like Ninja becoming available again from Mixer's demise, was this the perfect time for Twitch to revamp their own reputation? Talking a lot. His chubby cheeks, 13-year-old bratty attitude because his parents never disciplined him type of mind frame. It's chatting it up in the chat. Uh, I'd like to see, where's your top 10? <laughs> you haven't even gotten a victory. Ugly kid, let's go through your little specs here. Outdated, outdated, everything about your life is outdated. No one's following your channel. It's horrible. Your graphics, terrible. Jacob, your name, you misspelled your own name. You can't even spell your own name. 
Get out of my face. Dr. Despet was, in many senses, a trash-talking, villainous character who was all kitted out to ruin some kid's day, and that was part of his appeal. But as we know, it made him a very contentious character point, who probably made his fair share of enemies. It's very possible that Twitch had some reservations regarding his behavior, and even if he wasn't directly breaching the guidelines, there was something immutable about his brand that conflicted with the sort of platform that Twitch was aspiring to be, and the people they were hoping to attract. All it took was a couple of those enemies to have the right opportunity to pounce and make a case for his removal from the platform. Not for any specific reason, but because he represented a bygone era for them, a generation of gamers that didn't create a welcoming environment for those that Twitch wanted to appeal to. The only reason he had been kept on was because Mix and other platforms had been placing pressure on Twitch to retain him as a draw for viewing numbers. But once that pressure was gone, they could finally take action in shaping the market the way they wanted to. And Dr. Disrespect was that vision's sacrificial lamb. Is there anything to support this theory? Well, it would certainly explain why Twitch were highly vague in their explanation and why Dr. Disrespect believed in his case enough to initiate a lawsuit against the platform. It will provide an underlying motive for the streaming platform's decision, one that could to them have a long-term benefit while fitting in with the broadly held idea that the doctor in the house hadn't committed any major malfeasances or serious breaches of a contract. It would explain why Twitch didn't want him back on the platform in spite of offering a settlement that he felt was acceptable, implying that they perhaps had a bit of doubt in the reasoning behind their case. It would also clarify why they really couldn't confront him about it or ask him to tune it down because it would be fundamentally opposed to who he is as a persona. Still, that's a lot for Twitch to gamble on without any actual instant to instigate a measure with a creator who was signed for a long-term multi-million dollar deal. Would it really be worth it? Although Dr. Dispet was certainly a more controversial large creator than most, his behavior still didn't really approach the boundary of exceptional. And in a time where all eyes were basically on anyone else but him, it would be a peculiar moment to begin working on your image by banning someone who was seemingly unrelated to the present controversies. With that said, there was always the possibility that Twitch banned Dr. Disrespect to distract from the controversies they were dealing with. But once again, surely there would be a less costly way to deflect attention than banning one of your most popular creators. I think the main problem with this theory is that it's one that is built around what we don't know rather than what we do know. And although it could fit nicely in with some of the black boxes of information, it can never really be the only option, particularly when those black boxes are so broad that they yield multiple different theories. What could be more substantial than this? I can confirm with my sources it is a permanent ban and i can confirm that it is not dmca but i do not have any information on what it is other than it's pretty serious. Well, I suppose there is one more theory, which is the elephant in the room. And that is that obviously Dr. Disrespect was alleged to have done something so serious that Twitch could no longer ignore it and had to take action against it or else they could have faced serious repercussions themselves. Do we know what Dr. Disrespect would have done? No. And honestly, when it comes to more serious matters, I feel uneasy even speculating. But we know that some who claim to know thought it was too serious to even mention. So there must have been some possible legal implications. What does this story say then? Well, Twitch which uncovered something or informed of something, they couldn't take it public because of those exact reasons themselves, and they didn't want to put themselves in the firing line or jeopardize a possible investigation. However, with the knowledge they had, they needed to take action so that person wasn't present on their platform. Assumedly, in their mind, this person posed a present threat to other users on the platform. Maybe the medium he was operating over was through these networks, and Twitch believed it to be their duty to cut those networks off. Additionally, with the recent criticism that they've been receiving of an action where severe misconduct was present, it would have reflected very poorly on them if information was released that showed they were aware of the wrongdoings taking place and has subsequently done nothing. I'll add that this doesn't mean Dr. Disrespect has done anything criminal, maybe he was completely innocent of whatever he'd been accused of, but given the external pressure and tense environment, Twitch felt compelled to act. As reluctant as they were to ban one of their largest, most recognizable names, maybe the risk of doing nothing was just too great for them to roll the dice with. There was really no other option for them. What can be said in this story's favor? Well, I suppose the first thing to note was obviously the claim that some names in the industry corroborated this theory and made public statements that seemed to imply that something serious had occurred. It provides a rationale behind Twitch's behavior and both parties' reluctance to speak about the actual reason as whether true or false could affect either credibility or culpability. It would explain some of the brand reactions if they'd been informed of the reason for his ban and would explain why he has struggled to obtain contracts for any other large platform as far as we know. That sort of information may be considered privileged and it may explain why we don't know. But surely if this was the case, 
we would have heard something. Or at least, we should have heard something. Twitch didn't just unpartner Dr. Disrespect, they deplatformed him. A few days before Dr. Disrespect launched on YouTube, Slash reported that although YouTube would not stop the doc from streaming on his platform, they wouldn't be signing any deals with him, as if that was some sort of point against him. I have seen no evidence. I have investigated fully of that there's a possibility of him going to another platform. Okay, YouTube is out that it, they have not been in any discussions uh, with Dr. Respect. We started 11 years ago here on YouTube. And boy, oh boy, oh boy, does it feel good to be back. The dude has still done well for himself in spite of YouTube's occasionally subpar streaming system. He has a fully monetized channel with 4 million subscribers. Some would look at this and conclude that what he did couldn't have been that heinous because he still had the opportunity to succeed elsewhere in the industry. Many would also note that disrespect took Twitch to court over this. Although criminals have certainly made bolder moves, for someone whose public reputation is so integral to his work, it would be surprising for him to put that at stake on a court case, which could have exposed him when he could have just as easily moved on. It seems this theory of serious malfeasance seemed the most plausible at first, but as time passed, it began to appear a little doubtful, though it's fair to say not impossible. However, not impossible isn't really the level of certainty we want to operate on. But I ask you now, do we have any other option? As I said earlier, the truth may be completely unrelated to all the theories we've discussed today. There are many variables in a case like this that it's too hard to account for every single one. But judging previous cases, general human behavior, and the nature of many of these large corporations, these hypotheses seem to be the most popular. Each one has their individual merit and logic behind it. Yet, there's a negative relationship within each of the theories. That being, the theories that give more reason behind Twitch's behavior give less reason behind Dr. Disrespect's behavior. The alternative streaming platform theory is probably the most believable in regards to how Twitch would act, but it seems really out of character for Dr. Disrespect to do anything like that. Although we do have clear evidence of Dr. Disrespect leaning into conspiracy theories, there's no real evidence of Twitch ever taking action against it in the past, and no reason to not just approach him and tell him to cut it out. Over time, I think many have tended towards those theories that are more sympathetic to the doc, not just because of the actual evolving facts surrounding the case, but because they want to believe that the guy genuinely didn't do anything wrong. They saw someone who had been singled out by a platform for a reason that they never explained and suffered consequences for being himself. Since the purple snake scummy ban, we've had a hit. we've taken a hit on so many different things behind the scenes, champs. And it's understandable, to be honest, because one of the more thought-provoking questions I'd say is who or how Twitch actually helped by doing this? Obviously, on the surface, Twitch didn't really help themselves. They lost a creator who brought in revenue and viewers and was subjected to a lawsuit. Certainly didn't help Dr. Disrespect, who felt so aggrieved he initiated the lawsuit in the first place. And although it did lead to some hijinks, I don't really think fans found the drama particularly gratifying. If Twitch's aim was to protect any particular party, they haven't really done much either. Sure, they've covered their own asses, but the dude just went to another platform and still possesses enough power to hold tournaments and attend events, even if the opportunities aren't quite as vast. If it ever did come out that Dr. Disrespect had been behaving, dare I say it, less than respectfully, would Twitch be completely in the clear for how they handled it? I have a hunch they wouldn't be. Early on, there were some viewers who believed that this was all a large ruse for a new era of Dr. Disrespect. I don't think many people are of that school of thought anymore, but sometimes it just seems like the only remotely plausible explanation because it's just so hard to make sense of it otherwise. It's hard to find an explanation that rationalizes the behavior of everyone involved. I often find myself returning to the question of Twitch's image, as that's the only real motive that I can find. By running such a secretive and often partisan system, Twitch set no real standard of conduct. The only thing that often seemed consistent was the fact that larger creators did receive better treatment than small creators. But the disappearance of Dr. Disrespect seemed to spit in the face of that belief leading many to conclude that it must have been truly exceptional behavior. But maybe Twitch saw an opportunity in image revamp, under pressure from a variety of media sources who all seemed to have the same grievance with him. This was their statement to say that they weren't complete pushovers, but would it have really worked? Well, I don't think so. Twitch still finds itself in and out of the spotlight for the decisions they take. They're still accused of employing double standards for their preferred creators, and it's hard to make the case that the atmosphere on the platform has changed since the doc's departure. 
It's really hard to say if the doc was an influence on that in the first place or if he was just running his own show. Twitch is so large at this point that the creator leaving doesn't seem to exert great cultural influence. Sure, he's popular, well-known, influential, and he still is, but he's never been a singular spokesperson for the gaming community. Dr. Disrespect's popularity was just a reflection of gaming culture rather than being some industry-wide puppeteer. And there have been many more serious examples of toxic behavior on the platform in the last couple years. Not to mention Dr. Disrespect's own more serious antics that were often given the soft touch by the Twitch moderation team. These dum dums at Twitch are approving other. They are approving wannabe doctor. Oh, I don't fucking. Anyways, just wanted to let you guys know. No, I thought it was Villa. I tried. Some could say his expulsion was in a way designed to prevent the accusations of double standards when they took more serious action against toxicity, but it's not like those accusations ever seemed to concern them in the past. The truth is, Twitch really haven't done that much. They've rewritten their terms and conditions a few times, tried to stay on the pulse with popular opinion and what social media is saying, but that's not new. All of these platforms are works in progress that adapt themselves to the zeitgeist. Twitch didn't seem to undergo any radical reforms as a consequence than banning Dr. Disrespect, and you'd think if they saw creators with his attitude as that much of a threat than they would have. As a large corporate conglomerate with business interests at heart, people struggle to rationalize Twitch's behavior, which is why many end up siding with Dr. Disrespect. But how are we even to know that this was a corporate decision? My experience is that the trust and safety division of Twitch makes decisions independent of any other department in Twitch, including partnerships. So they don't even make decisions based off of what account managers or people that are actually running the partners even think they're making their own complete different decisions and they're empowered to do so trust and safety has the sole and exclusive ability to ban people on twitch and they have no other oversight in that matter except their own people the people that are making decisions on bans exclusively uh, for enforcement are trust and safety trust and safety is an entirely anonymous so you will not find a single person that works there even if you look anywhere um, an entirely anonymous division of Twitch that decides um, that has sole power over deciding on bans. There's been some discourse about how Twitch handled their bans. And I think one thing to note is that it's often a very select few who actually hand down and enforce those bans. And it's an extremely secretive process. Who is to stop it from getting personal? We know Dr. Dispect is a little more than just a character. He could have easily pissed someone powerful at Twitch off, with them coming to the conclusion that they just didn't want him around. Maybe he didn't do anything criminal. Maybe he didn't even breach the guidelines that time. He just did or said something behind the scenes that made an individual or fellow streamer feel compelled to take action against him. Maybe out of spite or maybe to save their own skin. Perhaps a personal matter overlapped into business. If it was a private matter, then who knows where or when it happened, or anything that could be revealed that may bring certain figures into disrepute. We often see Twitch as an entity, and the decisions they make as collective, but the truth is a company is still made up of a lot of people with their own motivations. Choices are seldom taken without personal bias, and even if there were some forms of corporate justification, it's completely valid to suggest that this was instigated on a personal whim, even if it wasn't presented as such. This just extends the realm of possible theories to nearly intangible levels and leaves us right back where we started. Many believe the best in Dr. Disrespect because they see Dr. Disrespect as the human he is. And although Twitch really didn't do the best to differentiate themselves from robots with their public statements, they're still a company full of humans too. They're just people whose decisions may only ever be known to themselves, providing us very little evidence to work with. And when looking for explanations, we latch on to what we have. But as said, Maybe the key here is what we haven't, and perhaps there's not much we can do about that. Many internet dwellers have this inherent desire to find out the truth of a situation, and in a way, it's understandable. When we have the truth, we can make a more balanced judgment. However, with 99% of disputes, we have to accept that we will never have the full picture to pass judgment without any reservation at all. With that said, with this case, we have a lot less than that, and it makes it even harder for anyone to arbitrate with clarity. Nonetheless, people still like to have strong opinions, and in the time following his ban and looking at the record of Twitch and the doc respectively, people decide that whatever the truth, the doctor disrespect had probably been done dirty and deserved better from a platform he had enthusiastically hosted his content on and supported behind the scenes for years. This is a guy who was involved in the Justin.tv years, much longer than most of Twitch's biggest names right now. People have got to understand, you got to attack, 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 but don't get him mistaken.
Now, we must accept that there are circumstances where loyalty would not be enough to exonerate one's actions. But since we have no idea what these actions are and only rumors to base our suspicions off, it's fair that many erred on Dr. Disrespect's side. I think people looked at the rumors of the more serious acts that were alleged to have occurred and thought, if nobody's willing to put it out there, then they can't be that confident in it. There are of course other reasons why something may not be public. And no stranger to this, a lot of companies were much more anxious about the fact that nothing had been said. They likely believed that reputational damage could be inflicted if they partnered with a person who was soon revealed to be acting outside the realm of acceptability. For a while, not even Dr. Disrespect appeared to know what happened. I'm sure he was probably more well informed than anyone else, but it's not like he could publicly theorize either, as that would make him liable if he believed he had grounds to take legal action. So he wasn't going to say anything, and when he did, it was non-committal or dismissive of certain theories, such as the one that revolved around the final stream. Eventually, legal action was initiated, and we thought that, once resolved, the one factor that may have been causing the secrecy would be relieved, and we'd finally find out the truth, especially if the doc secured his return to Twitch. However, it seemed as part of that settlement, neither party was going to be discussing the matter any further, both releasing highly impersonal statements that could barely be distinguished between each other. Even the agreement itself was hard to read into, as it's difficult to say how much money was offered and how that reflected in the strength of the case against Twitch. All we know is that the doc was confident enough to file a lawsuit against the company, but also happy enough to settle. There are a lot of ways to interpret that which depend on details that we don't know. Listen, I, I just point out the, the obvious. Plus, you know, once I got banned from the Purple Snakes platform, they they like secretly shadow banned and stopped talking to us and all that stuff. And to me, like I took it personal. Like, what the fuck do we made multiple commercials? We did lots of deals and to exclude us from anything and to not allow like, like trust me, there's, you know, design half the maps for, for advanced warfare. Like we've done a lot with the franchise, right? And, and for them to turn the sh cold shoulder like that. Trust me, I take a I took it personal. It's clear that the consequences of the Twitch ban are still in place, and Dr. Disrespect even vents his frustration from time to time on the matter. Recently, he hosted a Zero Bill tournament on Fortnite, with some popular Twitch streamers also competing. Boom TV, the host of the event, released a statement to competitors explaining that it was prohibited for them to knowingly feature the suspended gentleman in question, and providing suggestions and alternatives to avoid experiencing any negative repercussions for interacting with him. Hard to say if Doc saw the funny side of this, though he did manage a little Twitter chuckle. We understand that there may be instances where suspended users may appear on your stream due to circumstances beyond your control, such as through third-party gaming tournaments, but we expect that you make a good faith effort to remove them from your broadcast, mute them, or otherwise limit their interactions with your stream. Who knows whether the truth will ever come out? Maybe at some point in the future, some will decide they have very little to lose by speaking openly about it. But for the moment, it remains a mystery. I'm sure some will wonder why, if the facts were in Dr. Disrespect's favor as much as they were, he wouldn't just speak up, regardless of the consequences. Surely it's better to illustrate how ludicrous Twitch were in banning him, right? Well, I think the greatest concern for a creator and businessman like Dr. Disrespect would be to have his career defined by the ban. And in a way, it was a challenge to avoid it. It was such a seismic shift in the community that very few could miss it. There's little doubt that the uncertainty has prolonged people's discourse surrounding it, making us wonder if it had been over sooner if the doc had just spilled the beans and allowed people to make their own judgment. However, there's no guarantee that any explanation would provide a closure, and if it was contentious enough, could have very easily instigated more conflict if someone wanted to dispute it. In this case, it may very well be that the less anyone said, the better. The financial setback of being banned from Twitch is great, but the setback of having your career overshadowed by conflict, whether you're in the right or not, is so much greater. If the guy had lost everything already, then maybe he would have been a bit more tenacious in court. But he still had a channel, a fan base, a company, partnerships, and a variety of other outlets that were worth no less of his time. It's understandable that some people to this day still want to know what exactly happened. But the truth is, we're just not entitled to it. And there's no guarantee that knowing would enhance our lives or our judgment in any way at all. There's nothing wrong with theorizing, but sometimes we just have to settle with theories and decide who we want to support in a situation. I think that's what Dr. Disrespect would prefer at least. He knew he had to address it, but his tone in the interviews always showed a bit of disdain for the theories that people were advocating and even hinting at. The general impression I received from him is that he's the sort of guy who believes that he will rebuild everything if he has to, with or without Twitch but he'd much rather talk about that. He spent long enough in the industry to know how to survive. Whether he'll truly ever have the last laugh is something that's yet to be revealed. But for now, it seems that everyone got what they wanted.
As a company, Twitch has continued to dominate in their domain, YouTube and Facebook gaming have both retained their presence, but they can't come close to the control that Twitch exerts on the market. Don't get me wrong, they're still on their bullshit, but creators are still going to stream and viewers are still going to tune in, because there's no platform that can provide you with the streaming dream like Twitch does. You can't blame people for wanting to take advantage of that, but as Dr. Disrespect found out, sometimes you have to modify your dreams a little. Millions of minutes watched is the number one metric. And it's right here on Twitch. It's a shame that Dr. Disrespect Twitch era ever had to come to an end, but whether there was a good reason or not, there's always an opportunity for a new era to begin. I'm excited, extremely excited that the team at Midnight Society absolutely busted their asses off. And uh, we're here to change the game. Twitch and Dr. Disrespect had a very prosperous business relationship. In many ways, it was one that seemed mutually beneficial and deeply rooted for the large proportion of its existence. Twitch as a platform trying to cement its status in the gaming scene, and the Doc as an ambitious and outspoken persona looking for a medium that supported his antics. Over the years, Doc Disrespect grew his channel, but also his brand, becoming an identifiable figure for those inside and outside the community, garnering a media presence like few other creators. Twitch obviously provided the platform, but Dr. Disrespect did provide a standout persona in a sea of creators whose appeal was often based on other aspects of their content. That's not a discredit to them, but it's definitely a credit to the doc, whose longevity on an ever-evolving platform seemed nearly guaranteed. When the competition picked up and certain creators migrated to other platforms, our titular character only strengthened his relationship with the website that had fostered his growth over the years, pledging his allegiance in the most binding way possible with a life-changing contract that likely produced eye-watering sums of money. In spite of his illustrious career up to this point, this was still a significant step forward. Everything seemed to be going right, which was the perfect time for something to go wrong. As we've seen, there are a plethora of theories for what exactly happened, but the underlying theme of it was that Twitch likely made the judgment that that mutual benefit of their relationship had run its course, and the dock had become a liability. Whether that was due to divergence in common goals, or a specific incident that left Twitch feeling like they had to take action, is hard to entirely know. But the impact was long felt. Like, how can you be done on just, like, not on just Twitch? That's the part that, like, ha like, that goes deep if it's every platform that you're done. It's terrifying to see right now. I mean, that that's just this is just nuts. I I, I if if this is true, this is the biggest creator out there to this extent. That was the thing. Regardless of who you sided with or your own personal suspicions, there was always cause for concern. Whether you felt that it was a stark reminder that Twitch could take a person's platform away without even blinking twice or whether you felt it represented concern for how creator may have behaved, not being shielded from people who may be affected by their behavior. This had a ripple effect on audiences, platforms, and even other businesses who were previously affiliated with the doc, collaterally influencing not only his direct income in the moment, but also his mobility in the community and all the perks that he'd previously derived from being a streamer. It put Dr. Disrespect in a position where he could suck it up and move on or try to fight for his place once more. And I have to be intelligent about all this. Because you're talking about a heavy contract. Lots of money. <laughs> There's big money involved. So let the legal professionals do what they need to do. In a way, he seemed to try and exploit both options, spending the first year or so rebuilding his online presence on a new platform, expanding his business avenues, and even establishing his own company. In that time, he was often quite cryptic, not really giving much during interviews. When the time was right, he'd launched his lawsuit, likely playing to the visible financial damage that could be observed in the year following his banishment. We theorize on what the terms of the lawsuit could have been, but we know it probably emphasized what he had lost. Ultimately, in Dr. Disrespect's ideal world, he would have made his triumphant return to Twitch, with them admitting they had made a dire mistake. However, although it was clear that the streaming platform was prepared to offer a compromise, it was not one that necessarily included his Twitch channel. Advised by legal experts with probably more experience than you and I, he took that compromise, which also entailed saying as little as possible about it. And though sometimes it feels like the doc wants to say more than he should, he's professional enough to hold his tongue and continue on the trajectory he's set for himself. It's not easy to lose something that you've spent years building. And to feel like you're going back to the start in a way is probably one of the most demoralizing things that can happen. 
to a platform what is just another channel is a person's lifetime work all in one space. It's hard not to be bitter about that. And honestly, I don't think anyone would have blamed him for throwing in the towel. But Dr. Disrespect is no quitter. And in many ways, he turned a negative into something positive. We're going to make a game with our pros and we're going to make a game with you, our community. And we think that's a different way of making a video game than anyone's ever made one before. And even though making games is really, really hard and really, really challenging, we think by doing it this way, we have a really good chance of succeeding. In the past few months, there has definitely been an interest towards creator-run gaming studios. 100 Thieves, OTK, and of course, Midnight Society, headed by Dr. Disrespect himself and using his namesake as a significant selling point. The pivot towards creator-controlled games could really influence how the industry operates. The doc is at the forefront of that, and although there has been the occasional criticism for how the studio has been operated, there's still a lot of hope and anticipation for the output of more consumer-oriented games. However, the gaming studio does represent more than that, because it amplifies the doc's reach and gives him more of a standing in a community that he had struggled in due to his lost connections with Twitch. Doc, when can we expect a game from Midnight Society? Says Danger Levi with a 999. Probably like 40 years. And I'm going to push it back another 20 years every time I get asked. In a way, the more conspiratorial side of me sees these enterprises as Dr. Disrespect's attempt to be so omnipresent that Twitch will eventually have no other option but to acknowledge him. All these people on their platform playing a game by a person they banned, attending his tournaments. He can't be shunned from the industry when he is the industry. Wouldn't that be the sweetest revenge? I don't know, and I don't know if Twitch cares about it that much, but going forward, one can't help but wonder if their paths will cross once more, and how exactly it will be navigated. All I can say is that both Twitch and Dr. Disrespect seem determined to get their share. How successful they are is a story only time will tell. It's fair to say that the mystery of Dr. Disrespect's disappearance from Twitch may never be solved. A man at the peak of his popularity, having the rug pull from under him so unexpectedly, an abundance of theories that never quite unscrambled the enigma, and a court case that only mystified the facts. But within that mystery, there was a nugget of truth, that whatever the setback, even one where you lose your whole damn channel, it's never completely over. And for many, Dr. Disrespect is still just getting started. Let's climb the mountain, let's dominate. Violence, speed, and momentum, and guess what? We're at the tippity top of the mountain. But we're really, but we're really only halfway up. <laughs> Let's do it, baby! Okay, so that was the video. I hope you all enjoyed it. I know I did. I'd like to give a big thanks to the editors. They all did a wonderful job and their credits will be in the pinned comment. I'd like to give a big thanks to the patrons. All the $10 patrons are up on screen right now. Thank you very much. But I also have to give a very, very special thank you to the $50 patrons. Seri Tish, Velarex, Esther Bedoya, and Hypercube. Thank you for your continued support. It means a lot to me. I also want to give a big shout out to anybody whose art was used in this video. Once again, pinned comment and uh, go and send them some love. Artists do good, solid work. Speaking of art, thumbnail, Starfo, what a wonderful dude he is. Keep it up, man. Big thanks to the sponsor of the video, Raid Shadow Legends. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's good, good fun, good fun, good fun. Always working with them. I'm doing a little merch store project right now. If you're interested in that, check it out. We have some nice designs on show. Code Opinion for a really, really tasty discount. Uh, I don't really have too much else to say, but uh, I hope you guys are having a wonderful day. And um, uh, I hopefully will see you in the next one. No, no, no. We need more certainty. We need more conviction. I'm the right opinion, and I will see you in the next one.